Bitcoin's gonna go to $1 million someday, or even if it's 10 million, it's just gonna get to some big number and then it's just gonna tap out. That is not how economics work. Every day is election day. When my supplier, the people that sell soap and toilet paper and paper towels and all that kind of stuff, as soon as they start to accept Bitcoin, now my business can get paid in Bitcoin and not have to get out of Bitcoin. That's when we will see this absolute hockey stick. There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And I firmly believe that Bitcoin's time has come. Everything that world will be priced in Bitcoin. People who accept Bitcoin are far more likely to then go and spend Bitcoin. Bitcoin represents the first time in human history where the parallel economy is not being built in response to the collapse of empire. It has a head start. It has been built before the collapse of empire. Bitcoin economy may be the economy of the world. If we start to worship Bitcoin as God, then we've lost track of, of what money does. CBDCs would be the blight of humanity. They would be the most tyrannical tool in human history if Bitcoin didn't already exist. Bitcoin is a giant middle finger. It's a giant no to CBDCs. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Everything fine on your end? Things are good over here. It's actually Labor Day here in the United States. And so it's a uh, I'd scheduled a bunch of stuff. You and I had scheduled months out for this. And I, I just did that with my schedule. So my, my schedule's booked today, but it's nice because I'm in the office and nobody's here. So it's it's peace and quiet and it's actually a good environment to, to work in. So we call it Labor Day, but it's actually a pretty good day to put put in some labor. <laughs> Interesting. I, I I actually uh, had free podcasts today. I c just got to know about it now. Like I'm I'm sorry for my American friends that I unfortunately uh, got a podcast on Labor Day. <laughs> and it's, it's not a real holiday. It's like one of those ones where you know people get it off because it's a it's a it's a federal holiday. It's a national holiday. But I, I mean, it, it's good. I guess it's good for the for the for the employees and stuff. Every once in a while to, to get a day off and you know just go recharge the batteries. But you know, three day weekend didn't never hurt any, hurt anybody. But for me, to me, yeah, it's it's a good day to get stuff in. And I think it's the perfect start to talk about parallel economy and price controls because, like, it's a, a government holiday, so kind of governments <laughs> uh, dictated when people uh, are having holidays, which is a very interesting concept, especially in Austria. I think there's not one nation that has as many public holidays as Austria. I think there's not one holiday, one nation that has more than that. I, I didn't do a research, but I think we have a lot. Um, uh, how does, like, maybe uh, before we get actually to price controls and parallel economies, do you see uh, also, like, actually, like, a, a, a comp um, the government trying to get, uh, when you have holidays, also some sort of, of price control, not price control, but controlling the free market? Well, yeah, it is. I mean, it, it, it just clearly is like, why, why is that the position of the government to say when people can and cannot work? Now, that's generally viewed as positive, but, but stimulus checks during COVID were generally viewed as positive. You know, just, just because people generally like something doesn't mean that it's not centrally planned fiat government. Um, unfortunately, that's much, that's, that's much more akin to, to socialism um, than it is to a free market. It just clearly is not free market basics when the government is telling you days that should be working and then days where you should not be working. Um, for example, in my company, we are a big believer in taking time off and having time to, to rest and recover. Um, we, we are closed in, a, in, in my wellness uh, studios. We're closed every Sunday. We, we're not open on Sundays. Um, part of, for me, part of that comes out of a, of a religious conviction of, of having a day of rest. But for my employees that aren't religious, it's it's a just a much needed day off. And so we know and my, my employees, if you work for me, you can count on the fact that you're not going to get calls. You're not going to get texts or emails or any of that kind of stuff on on Sundays. Now, sometimes I will work on Sundays and I make sure that that if I'm if I'm sending my store managers emails or anything like that, I schedule it so that it doesn't go out and doesn't hit their inbox until Monday morning because I don't want them to have to be dealing with stuff that, that I as the entrepreneur, I have the burden of always being on the clock, always, always ready to take a call or something like that. But if you're an employee of a job, then I think that's one of the benefits of the free market is as an employer, I can make my place of business more appealing by structuring our schedule, structuring our, our compensation. All of that's part of the free market. If I want to outdo my competitors, then it's not just my prices and it's not just the level of service we have. It's also the type of people we attract. And so if I can attract better people because I offer better 
incentives for working for me. That is the free market at work. That's how you, you that's how you incentivize competition amongst businesses. Now, when the government steps in, they say this, this is the day you work. These are the days you don't work. It's not we, we it's not uh, it's not the end of the world. And, and it's not where it sounds like we're splitting hairs here, but it just shows that government is creeping their way in. And then I think the more insidious part of it is that it, it, it instills in the in the minds of people uh, who don't consider these things. It it instills this idea that government is supposed to be the one that dictates those things. And, and so that's the problem is that the average person thinks that, oh, well, let me look to the government's lead on when I should be working. Let me look to the government's lead on. What is the minimum about amount of money I should be making per hour? What is the what is the government's uh, take on how much paid time off I should get when I'm when I'm sick? Right. All of those things. People act like if the government didn't do those things that that the free market wouldn't have an answer for those. Guess what? Paid time off. Same thing. The government here in California says that we have to provide a certain amount of paid time off. It's actually pretty generous what the what the state of California does. It's not generous on their part because they're just using other people's money to do it. But as a business owner, we always try to exceed. Like if uh, one of my employees just had a just had a baby, she's a single mom. We gave her more time off with more pay than what the state of California offers, and we intentionally did that, even though it's a sacrifice of our business, because we want to outdo what the government does, because we want to attract better and brighter people to our business, um, and we also want to reverse engineer this idea that the government's the one that gives this to you. No your company, the one who, who's got your back. Cause you, you come in, you work 40 hours a week, you get our back. We are going to get your back when you need it. That's how you attract really good people. The free market could do that. If my, if my competitor down the street is offering really good paid time off incentives, well, if I want to attract better people and beat him, I need to offer better paid time off incentives. So the free market would actually be more generous to employees than the government. The government just set, sets a minimum threshold. Um, and that, that creates again, this idea that people look to the government for their next, what, what's my next step? What is the next thing I should do with work? If we look to the free market, we'd have a lot better solutions. And so it's so interesting. Do you have in America also supermarkets closed on Sundays? Uh, supermarkets are not closed on Sundays. So the supermarkets, supermarkets. are, are open. Yeah. 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 The supermarkets actually that if you if you're a supermarket employee you better be prepared to work cuz that is one thing where where uh those people they, those they're open early in the morning they're open late at night and they're open on holidays i mean they're open on christmas they're open on new years they're open on whatever whatever holidays supermarkets are are kind of one of those exceptions it's the same thing with covid though you saw even with covid supermarkets were open i mean you, you got to have food i guess is 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 the government's take on it so uh yeah that is that is one of the exceptions but if it's a bank If you're a bank employee, I mean, you're you're getting off every random holiday that that you that you could possibly imagine. And now, again, as a business owner, to me, that's frustrating because it's uh, it's Monday morning here in the United States, and this goes back to how awesome Bitcoin is. All the payments I got last week in Bitcoin, which we don't get a ton of payments in Bitcoin, but we do accept Bitcoin payments in, in my businesses. Um, I got them within four seconds. You know, so if I sold something on Thursday morning, we got that payment within four seconds because we, we, you know, we use lightning. Uh, anything in fiat where somebody swiped a credit card, I still have not gotten paid for that. Here we are Monday morning. I still haven't gotten paid for it. I'm going to get paid for it tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning for things that I sold on Thursday. So we put out the time, the expense, the labor, the utilities to air, air conditioning our building, all those, all those expenses accrued for us. But we still haven't gotten paid for all those things and we won't get paid until at least tomorrow because these bank holidays again the government says banks get to close what does that mean for businesses it means you're taking an extra 24 hours where's that money that money is somewhere somebody's making interest on that money it sure isn't me it's not the person who spent that money with me it's not the customer it's not me the, the merchant these banks they get to close down limiting their expenses and this is government government ordained the government said hey you get to close so so none of your employees have to work and you get to hold on to this money for another 24 hours well 24 hours holding on to this money doesn't sound like a lot but when you're talking about a hundred billion dollars of of money that's sloshing around just a a few basis points of interest for that day that you're going to earn it is a ton of money over a year over a year period 
Uh, it's an amazing business model for the banks. It is <laughs> interesting also for me because I uh, first only took payments in, in fiat because I was afraid of taxes and stuff like that for my podcast. Now two out of my three podcast uh, sponsors actually pay me in Bitcoin. And one uh, we did actually yesterday. It was a Sunday uh, and we just uh, set everything up. It was really quick and we had it in like 10 minutes and it was on a Sunday uh, and it was amazing. And with, with, uh, feared we would have not gotten it because also different continents like mm -hmm. the unique routing numbers and all that shit and a lot of fees uh and it, it it was such a such a pleasure doing that like it was such a nice experience I, I love it but i brought the sunday supermarket question up because here in austria and i think that's a great example of government intervention here in austria sunday supermarkets are closed except those on uh, train station or gas stations because they said like people that drive through Austria, they have to have something for food, but the people that live here, apparently not. Wow. <laughs> so what happens is in a big city, for example, in Vienna, uh, I live close to train station and here you can go to the supermarket, a very small uh, train station supermarket, and there's a line in front of it. like like 15 people waiting to get into the supermarket uh, just because the government doesn't want supermarkets to be open except in a train station where I'm like, it, that's, that shows when the government intervenes in the free market, this creates inefficiencies. I always bring that example up because mm -hmm. I think it's a great one to show uh, the government intervention if inefficiencies. Yeah. Can I, can I ask why do they, do they say why things are closed Sunday? Yeah, it's a religious thing, uh, Christian. Oh. Great <laughs> Christian. <laughs> as, as, a, uh, as a Christian, I vehemently am opposed to the government mandating Sundays being closed. We're closed Sundays. I don't think the government should do that, especially for for things like groceries. Like, holy cow! Wow. Yeah, it's uh, and it's 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 so irrational because, for example, restaurants are open, of course. So, like, why why is the restaurant waitress not getting off, but the the supermarket uh, like it's 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 so irrational. And the the train station supermarkets are the same brand, like the same company that have the normal <laughs> supermarkets. So like, it it has absolutely there's no no reason. But uh, sorry for for bringing that up. It's, no, I think I, it's a great I think example. That's fascinating. I'm I'm genuinely intrigued by that wow well and and but, sorry not to make this like a religious thing but that's like jesus these, these you know these these politicians are saying they're christians well like jesus repeatedly talks about the sabbath like as one of the things that him and the pharisees con conflict conflicted over like he actually did work on sundays because he said the heart of the message is well it's, it's this time to to restore and, and recover and, and and you know have some prayer time and stuff like that but when there's meaningful work that needs to be done. I'm going to go ahead and do it right like that. That's that's it's the antithesis. So they're they're guilty of the legalism, the very legalism in which Jesus came and spoke against. And yet they're creating this legalism in terms of codifying it in terms of the government. I mean, it's it's the highest form of of, of hypocrisy and it's based in misunderstanding, which is quite frustrating. Yeah, uh, it's it's frustrating sometimes as an entrepreneur in, in Austria. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, back to the topic of, of parallel economies, I think that's a great gateway. Um, first of all, you wrote a book on that. So first question, what is your main takeaway fr from the book? What what are you hoping that people get from it? The main point of the book, I can give you, I'll give you the thesis of the book in a second, but the, the takeaway, I hope, is the last chapter it ends on a really bright note and um it's really easy to get jaded as bitcoiners to think and jaded in a negative way or like kind of become nihilistic of um because we're, we're so aware of the way the fiat system works and it feels like the government and the the cartel and all these powers that be um they just have so much power and they do but power structures rise and fall all the time and the last chapter of the book it's it's actually not a very political chapter um not not at all the last chapter is called Every Day is Election Day. And what I mean by that is that everything you do is a vote for either the old system or like, I guess, the existing system or the new system. Um, the comparison I make is uh, election votes versus economic votes. And, and everything you do is economics. When you turn on Netflix, that's economics. And you say, oh, well, I already paid for that at the beginning of the month. So me watching this show versus that show, that's not economics. No, that is, you're telling Netflix where to put their dollars. 
because this show people like to watch, people don't like to watch this show. Everything you do, you, if you can't do something that's devoid of economics. You say, well, I'm not even going to eat a meal right now because that's, I don't want to make an economic decision. I'm going to try and disprove Brian. No, you made an economic decision. There's now more money in your bank account. You're maybe more hungry, but you made an economic decision. The restaurant you were going to go to now is devoid that money that you were going to get. So everything we do is economic decisions. And so the reason why I say economic decisions are more important than elective decisions or electoral votes is because say there's a, there's an election with a hundred million votes and we're talking about a political election and candidate a gets 51 million votes. And so he gets 51% of the votes. Candidate B got 49 million. He got a lot of votes. I mean, 49 million is a lot of people, but politics is a zero sum game. So the day after the election, those 49 million votes have all the value of zero. They literally mean zero the very next day because the guy that got 51% of the votes now gets 100% of the power. Now, that doesn't mean your vote doesn't count. I, I believe that we should vote. I, I, I do believe that we should, but it just shows your vote has limited power. Now, let's imagine that there's, there's a company that last year they did $100 million in sales. This year, because they did something that people don't like and people start to boycott that company, now that company only does $51 million in sales. They get 51% of the sales that they got last year, but the $49 million of votes that they didn't get this year, every single one of those 49 million hurts them. It hurts their bottom line. It's not a zero sum game. You've stripped 49% of their power away, whereas the political official gets 100% of the power no matter what you did. So. It doesn't mean that we're going to take back the majority right away by making good decisions, but you're you're stripping away the power of the existing structure in a different way than you can with politics. And so as Bitcoiners, we inherently understand this to some degree, right? Because instead of putting $100 in fiat or saving $100 in fiat, we put $100 in our cold storage in Bitcoin. You've just made 100 votes. You've taken 100 votes. And actually, every economic vote we have against the old system has the power of two because not only are we taking one vote away from the existing system we're adding one vote to the new system so it's minus one on the on the existing system ledger and plus one on the new system ledger and so we don't need to change everything overnight incremental change changing a few things per day um, if you go through and you like audit your day you'll find that you make hundreds literally hundreds of decisions every single day you don't need to change everything you do. Um, I still watch a lot of YouTube. I'm, I'm becoming more compelled to start watching Rumble and watch more things on X because YouTube's becoming a bigger and bigger problem, right? And so I can't, I, 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 there's a lot of things I like on YouTube. So I don't go, I don't cut out YouTube cold turkey, but I try to find more of the shows that I like on alternative sources, that, that places I like to, to give my business. And I'm not, I'm not a hero because I'm not cutting out something overnight and going to the new system. What I'm doing is I'm phasing those things out. Just like you start to stack stats, most people don't live 100% in Bitcoin. They still have a little bit in the fiat world and a little bit in the Bitcoin world. That's fine. If every human on earth was still a little bit in fiat, but they were kind of adding more to their Bitcoin stacks every day, the fiat world would slowly be deprived of oxygen and the, the, the Bitcoin world would, would be built. And so that's the hope at the end of this book is we walk through what the fiat social layer is and how propaganda works. I mean, it's a deep dive. If you're curious as to how propaganda works and how we got to where we are, um, this was my background. This is my field of study in, in college is human behavioral science. And how do how do we use propaganda to manipulate you? Um, I have a couple of videos coming out on my, on my YouTube and Rumble channels pretty soon about the 11 ways that your politician uses propaganda. So we're going to do uh, 11 ways that uh, candidate Harris is using propaganda and 11 ways that President Trump is using propaganda to manipulate voters. Even if whether, and I'm, I'm actually going to vote for Trump unless something changes, um, but I'm, I'm releasing a video on the propaganda that he uses because I think it's important that we understand how people manipulate us because yes trump is trying to manipulate my vote um and it's important we we understand that so that i can hold my political candidate accountable so yes we go through this murky stuff throughout parallel of um the way that the fiat social layer works but at the end of the day i firmly believe the bitcoin social layer the people that are adopting a new and better system are going to win because 
like you've heard before, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And I firmly believe that Bitcoin's time has come. It's fascinating, really, really cool. Um, is it then also really important that we start living in the Bitcoin economy, try to like accept Bitcoin payments, try to maybe even pay for things in Bitcoin if we can, and like to, to vote with our economic power? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think that's very difficult. We I have a whole uh, section on hodl versus spend um, because that's contentious. I, I, I've lost more followers on on Twitter over saying, "Hey, you should spend your Bitcoin," um, because Bitcoiners don't like that. They said, "Oh, you're that's a sell order every time that you're doing that," and which which sometimes I guess you spend it at a business and the business might sell it. So I, I understand that argument. But we go through this. We go through the nuance of it. Um, what I would say is if you don't want to spend your Bitcoin, that's fine. All you need to do to plug into the parallel economy is start accepting Bitcoin. Don't spend it, just accept it. So if you're a barber, put in your Twitter profile that you're the Bitcoin barber or sign up for Orange Pill app because Orange Pill app helps you find, uh, shameless plug right here, Orange Pill app helps you find local Bitcoiners. And so the, uh, the reason why I say barber is because I just found my barber on Orange Pill app. I, I, I travel 30 miles. I go way further for my barber than I would because he accepts Bitcoin. I pass literally probably dozens of barbers to go to my barber, maybe even 100 barbers because it's so far away. And in Southern California, traveling 30 miles, it takes me 90 minutes to get to my barber. I go to him specifically because he accepts Bitcoin. So My barber is doing better business now than ever because he gets all of his fiat customers from those around him. But because of Orange Pill app, he's made all these other social connections of people in Southern California that he would have never gotten because nobody's going to travel 20 or 30 miles just to pay money to a fiat barber. Because at the end of the day, good, my barber gives good haircut. There's other barbers that I've gotten very close to me. They also give good haircuts. I want to participate in the parallel economy. And so he doesn't do a lot of spending of Bitcoin. But what he does do is he accepts Bitcoin and he gives a place for people like me to spend our Bitcoin. Same thing through the Bitcoin plumber. If you're a graphic designer, whatever you do, put it in your orange pill out pro profile, put it in your Twitter profile, put it in your Nostra profile, do that. And guess what? All of a sudden you'll be having sats trickle in for the work that you're providing. And what I've found is people who accept Bitcoin are far more likely to then go and spend Bitcoin. There's this weird psychological phenomenon that comes with, oh, I bought these and so this is my savings versus I earned these from the parallel economy. And you see that, that's why we call it a circular economy. You see the reality of this circular economy. Oh, it came in, so I don't have to worry that I'm never gonna get these stats back, right? If I spend these back into the economy, it actually gives me more connections to more people who spend sats. So what I found is, When I started spending sats, I started earning more sats, right? Isn't that the whole premise of a business in fiat, in, in the fiat world? I, I invest money in my business. Why would I invest $10,000 to start a business? Because I have the inherent belief that that's going to be capital well used and I will earn more than $10,000 by starting this business. Nobody starts a business to just have that money go away. But when you spend sats in the economy, it's like investing in a business. I spend a thousand sats in the economy, but that gives me more social connections and more economic connections. And now, now there's more people that want to buy my stuff. So I spend a thousand sats, but for whatever reason, I earn three sat, three thousand sats because I provide more value than I'm taking in. And that's the basis of any good economic actor in a in a in an economy. So if you want more sats spend more sats. But if you don't want to spend sats on day one, just start telling people you'll accept sats. Yeah, and I think if you're actually a person that lives on 100% Bitcoin, um, that's, that plays out. Like we, uh, I think two or three days ago, we went through the calculations of like having uh, a little bit of a fiat stack versus having everything in Bitcoin and spending those Bitcoin with apps that sell the Bitcoin and then spend it. Uh, and it actually kind of works out even with the capital gains tax because you only make capital gains tax on, on things that rise and we, we made this calculations and it actually can work. And there are also a lot of different other methods how you can do it. I personally choose not to do it. Like I have my Bitcoin stack and I have a, uh, a almost 0% uh, a fiat stack, but so 
just enough that I can pay my bills. Uh, I, I choose to do it like that, so I don't have to uh, <laughs> do a lot with my with my tax confirms. But it it works. You can work, uh, live on Bitcoin right now and be 100 percent in India, and that would be the best case scenario, I guess, for uh, what you are saying, the parallel uh, Bitcoin economy, because then you really vote with all your uh, economic power for Bitcoin, even those places where you spend uh, with fiat because you cannot spend the Bitcoin, you have a Bitcoin transaction uh, with that. So like that's a little bit better than only having a fiat uh, transaction, which is really, really cool. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's a great point. And everybody can go around about this a different way. If you're contributing to the parallel economy, if you're just holding and, and storing Bitcoin, that's you're doing you're doing good work, right? We're contributing to this. <clears throat> those who are, like you said, you accept it for your show and things like that. Those that are interacting with it on, on an economic level are creating the, the wheels of that industry a little bit better. There will be a point <clears throat> where if enough businesses start to accept it or not even accept Bitcoin, hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet. I think this is what Michael Saylor is trying to do. I think by him telling everybody how to keep a Bitcoin treasury it then is step one for a lot of these bigger businesses to say, okay, at some point we could accept Bitcoin because we now hold it as a treasury asset. And so we can just keep profits in Bitcoin. Um, think about the impacts of this. People don't want to spend their Bitcoin in the parallel economy right now because they're worried that businesses are going to sell. Like if you spend it with me, I've got to sell it into fiat because you know my, my, my business needs supplies. And so to buy paper towels and toilet paper and soap and all that kind of stuff for my business, I'm going to need to sell my Bitcoin, which is going to you know, put a suppression on the price, and then I'm going to get into fiat. So it's, it's not really helping anything. Well, think about when my supplier, the people that sell soap and toilet paper and paper towels and all that kind of stuff, as soon as they start to accept Bitcoin, now my business can get paid in Bitcoin and not have to get out of Bitcoin in order to buy my supplies. That's when we will see this absolute high, uh, hockey stick of Bitcoin parallel economy adoption because now merchant, excuse me, uh, uh, customers won't have to be worried that the merchants are going to have to sell their Bitcoin to get out of it. And I think we're just a few clicks away from that. But all this stuff, it's like building a plane while flying it. Michael Saylor has to do his stuff. He has to get businesses excited about holding a treasury position. And we, the plebs, have to get people excited about spending it in this micro parallel economy that's happening right now. We get the macro parallel economy if we develop the micro parallel economy. Um, and I mean, there's just there's just so many things. I know we were talking about price controls and we kind of dabbled in that a little bit. Um, there's things that the governments are doing that make parallel economies emerge 100% of the time or nearly 100% of the time, um, price controls being one of them. And so it's better to have an organized parallel economy ahead of time because in the past, every time, this is the thesis, I told you I'd get to the thesis of the book. You, this is my long roundabout ways of doing it. The thesis of the book is that every time empire collapses, whether you're talking about the Roman empire, the, the Persian empire, the Soviet union, whatever it is, at any point in history, every time empire collapses, a parallel economy always springs up in its wake. Now, it's always in response to the collapse of empire. Think about it. The supply chains, the, the government who used to give you everything, that collapsed. And so the people need to fend for themselves. And so either a barter system emerges or they, they, they resort to, to old coins or metal coinage or whatever it is, like local currencies and things like that. A parallel system always reemerges, but that only lasts four to 12 to maybe 15 years. It lasts like half of a generation because it's, it's decentralized, which is great. But unfortunately, it's also highly disorganized. Decentralization is inherently disorganized. And so when the new state power comes along, like the Soviet Union collapses and then the state of Russia kind of re-centralizes power, it inevitably reabsorbs the parallel economy because it's so disorganized. And so people go back to the state economy. That happens 100% of the time. Empire collapses, parallel economy emerges, state gets powerful, and then the parallel economy gets reabsorbed. Bitcoin represents the first time in human history where the parallel economy is not being built in response to the collapse of empire. It has a head start. It has been built before the collapse of empire. So the one thing that made it so that the, the 
that the economy got reabsorbed, the parallel economy got reabsorbed back into the state economy was the disorganization. If we can create an organized enough decentralized economy, we may never go back to a true state economy. The Bitcoin economy may be the economy of the world. So you're saying that the, we, we might have the final money, the, the final end boss of, of money. The final end boss is Bitcoin. Uh, I, I love that a lot. What can we do uh, as plebs to, to get there, there faster? Well, I mean, I, I really think spending Bitcoin is, is, or and like I said, step one, accept Bitcoin. Just try to find things to accept Bitcoin. My kids get paid in their chores or for their chores in Bitcoin. Like my kids are highly incentivized. If you want to, it sounds stupid. It sounds like you're not participating in this, this parallel economy. You are. If I'm not paying my kids in a few dollars of fiat, but my kids are now transacting in Bitcoin, um, doing it. I'm like doing, I'm participating in this, right? My kids are much more incentivized by a thousand sats than $1. Like to a kid, unit bias is, is very important. Um, not only because the thousand sat sounds like a lot, but they do ask me, well, what's the dollar value of this? And all of my kids, we keep a spreadsheet of, of, of each of their wallets so they can see it at any time. They can see the dollar value of their Bitcoin going up. They're like, wow, I, I haven't done anything for, for two weeks and my, my money increased in value. You teach kids that and you'll, you are setting up the next generation for the parallel economy. Why do the communists, why do the, cent, the, the centralized power, the status, whatever you want to call them, why do they try to hijack our education systems? Because they know generational warfare is how you win the game. If we can train our kids to think in terms of a Bitcoin standard, we will win the generational warfare that is being waged. And the way we do it in the immediate term is just by finding all the small ways to opt out. If you're going to go to the grocery store and buy meat in fiat, we'll consider maybe trying to find a local rancher. Um, again, Orange Pill app is an app that facilitate helps facilitate local connection. So you might be able to find that person on Twitter, but I can guarantee you it's a lot easier to find local Bitcoiners on Orange Pill app because that's the it, it, that's the whole point of the app is to help you find people close to you. Find a local rancher, find somebody that will accept Bitcoin. So instead of doing that transaction in fiat. You're now doing it in Bitcoin. If you want to just buy Bitcoin for that transaction, you know, you don't want that to come out of your stash. Do that. Spend and replace or, or replace and spend however you want to do it. <clears throat> you might say, well, the exchange got, the exchange charges me, you know, 1% or 2% to buy that Bitcoin. Well, guess what? When you swipe your credit card, do you know how much the bank's charging you? They're charging you a 3% merchant fee. Now, You think that the business is paying that because you don't see it on your credit card. Where do you think businesses charge the fees, the taxes, the fees, all the, the, the expense that they have? They charge it to you in the price of the, of the meat or the unit. So you will actually save money by spending 2% to buy Bitcoin and then to send that transaction, even if you pay a thousand sats for the transaction fee or whatever, even if you're not using Lightning, if you're paying a few thousand sats for that transaction fee, You're probably going to save money by transacting in Bitcoin if you consider the true cost of what your merchant fees are paying for, for credit card processing and things like that. So people say at the end of the day, well, you know what, that's, you're kind of splitting hairs here. Yeah, I am splitting hairs because you want to talk about the nuance. What is my real answer? My real answer is shut up and just do it, right? Like kind of tongue in cheek. It's like, who freaking cares? Just start doing this stuff. Like, let's not think about the tax implications and the this and the that. And what if I lose a little bit of value on this transaction or whatever? Yeah, I, I get all those things. And if you want a long, exhaustive kind of nuanced discussion, then read Parallel because that's what we go through. But my podcast answer for this is, if we want to build a better future, let's just go out and build a better future. It's like, again, being an entrepreneur and saying, I want a really successful business. But man, that's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be really expensive to do that. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure if the outcome is going to be what I want. Well, then you're not cut out to, to start a business. Like business, to start a business or a podcast or any kind of entity, you need to have vision of what the end goal is and you need to be willing to sacrifice in order to get there. So if that's not your cup of tea, then stack sats and chill. That is awesome. That still helps Bitcoin's price and, and, and perhaps adoption and all those things. So God bless you. But if you really care about the parallel economy, then just start doing it. Just just start participating in it. Um, it's like, you know, people say, oh, you know, I come 
I come from a family that of, of meager means. And so I'm never going to be successful. Shut up. Like who cares? Like you, you do, because of the situation that doesn't dictate the outcome. Like you should be motivated that there's obstacles in your way. If there's obstacles in your way, the story that you get to tell your grandkids is 10 times better. Because if, if, if a generation from now we're telling everybody about, oh, I was, I was there when the parallel economy was born of Bitcoin. And it's like, oh, were there roadblocks, grandpa? It's like, nah, the government just gave us a free pass. They said there was no tax on the transactions. And actually you got a lollipop every time you spent Bitcoin. They'd be like, okay, well, grandpa, that's not cool. But if you said, you know what, there was a parallel system and it was kind of like this kind of murky thing and it was, it was, it was expensive and it was hard to, it was hard to find people where to spend my Bitcoin. And you know what, I thought I was going to get in trouble and you know, I didn't know what the government was going to say. Those are the stories that you tell your grandkids. So if you want to be a freaking legend, then start, start building this thing with us, right? Like we're here for this, like get on board and let's get the mission done. I mean, it's it, it's honestly, it, it's going to make for a good story someday. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30-minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. Uh, I, I love that a lot and especially lots of also the part where you talked about the kids and having uh, them directly on a Bitcoin standard because I think they have a major advantage. They don't have to unlearn all the fiat things. Like they don't have like a, a 50 or 55 year old man who has lived through the whole fiat game since 1971, for example. Uh, he is, has learned the fiat system all his life and someone that comes up now with i don't know 14 years old or 13 years old he comes up and there was always bitcoin in his life uh, and he has the advantage of maybe never really knowing about bitcoin i mean i uh, never really knowing about fiat uh, as man, i even me like i i got I'm all all in Bitcoin since I'm 21 years old. So that's an amazing, now I'm 25. So that's that's really cool to, to be so young in, in, in Bitcoin. Um, what do you think, um, what do you think can happen in a society that only has Bitcoin? Let's let's uh, go a little bit out. This parallel economy is actually the full economy. Mm. Uh, how different uh, is is that world? Well, I, I think it changes spending behavior to some degree. I, I think that you're really going to consider your purchases before you make them, um, because right now you're kind of incentivized to make impulse impulse decisions and impulse spends because my money's devaluing, and so I might as well spend it now. Um, we're not trained to, to make, or the average person isn't trained to make good economic decisions because you're holding a melting ice cube. But when you have 
something that's growing and you know i don't think it's going to make it so people don't want to spend their money um but you will just say that is this thing worth it is it adding value to my life people ask me all the time when you know especially when i like i used to work in crypto years ago back in like 2017 and i'm a bitcoin maxi now so but like i have great stories from the crypto days because that, that was that was the wild west and man holy cow that industry is corrupt um but but people because they they knew i worked in crypto they'd always ask what what was the perfect time to sell what's the perfect time to sell your bitcoin and i get regular people normies and say what's the perfect time to sell your bitcoin the perfect time to sell your bitcoin is to buy something in bitcoin that's going to add value to your life um, I'm a firm believer. I don't want to spend my Bitcoin, but if there's something that I can do to better my kid's life, better my wife's life, have, you know, better my relationship with, with anybody, I will spend my Bitcoin as much as I love to hold it because I value what money is for. If we start to worship Bitcoin as God, then we've lost track of, of what money does. Now, I hope that I was prudent in that, that I acquired that Bitcoin and then it gained value. So I was able to buy more with it than I would have if I had just held fiat. Um, but you think about what is a, and we have a whole chapter of parallel that covers this. And I think it's very exciting to think about what does an economy look like when you have a fixed supply of money? What happens to the value? Because I think what people think is going to happen is Bitcoin's going to go to $1 million someday and then it's going to stabilize and it's never going to, it's never going to increase in value because that's just $1 million is such a crazy number. Or even if it's 10 million, it's just going to get to some big number and then it's just going to, it's going to, it's going to tap out. That is not how economics works. If you have 21 million units of currency or 2.1 quadrillion or whatever the amount of sats is, um, what is it? 210 quadrillion or 2.1 quadrillion? I can't remember. Uh, 2.1. <laughs> 2.1. Yeah, sorry. There you go. Um, you have 2.1 quadrillion sats in the world. People think that, that okay, that's, that's, that's enough for the entire world. Well, once all of those sats are being held, if you have a fixed money supply and you have increasing productivity in your economy, that means the value of each certificate on that, that, that economy, which is your, your, your monetary unit, every unit of currency you have increases in value. It's like holding a stock in a company. What happens when you have one share of a company and that company is now more productive? They have more profit. They're doing more business. That one stock you have increases in value. That's how claims on an economy work. That's what money's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a claim on that economy and the productivity. And so What's going to happen in this next in this next 10 years? Do we think productivity is going to go down or up? Well, I think AI is going to make productivity absolutely explode. <laughs> I think you and I are going to have three AI models working for us at any given time to do all of our emails and to do all of our you know tedious tasks and stuff. So that's going to free me and you up to do all sorts of other big picture things to expand our productivity. So I'm going to become... 40 times more efficient. My, my employees are going to become 40 times more efficient. You're going to become 40 times more efficient. And so we're going to have an explosion of productivity in our economies and a fixed money supply. I think the value of Bitcoin is going to things that you would have never expected. I mean, you're talking about a billion dollars per unit of Bitcoin, per whole Bitcoin in, a, in an economy that's growing. Because again, 21 million, everything in the world divided by 21 million is this astronomical number. You think of like drive through a city, look at every building. You're talking about a $400 million building, a $500 million building, a $40 million building on the corner. That's just like a little building on the corner, $40 million. When everything in the world is priced in Bitcoin, the Bitcoin like I, I don't want to call it a bubble, but that, 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 that container, that thing that's trying to hold all the air in, we'll just call it a, we'll call it a, a balloon for this example, that balloon that's trying to trap all that economic value in it, as those things inside the balloon increase, that balloon has to get bigger. Bitcoin is going to be absolutely massive. And we've never seen one currency trap all the economic value of the world in it. The U.S. dollar has pretty much done that to some degree, but there is still a lot of value in the world that is valued in other currencies. And I don't, I don't think that little sovereign currencies and stuff won't exist. I don't think that the U.S. will clearly have their own sovereign currency to some degree. But Bitcoin will, everything in the world will be priced in Bitcoin. 
And that balloon is going to be absolutely massive. It's going to be so difficult to keep all that value in. And unfortunately, or fortunately, that balloon doesn't pop. That, that balloon expands because Bitcoin doesn't break, right? Just because you put more economic value into Bitcoin, it doesn't mean the miners can't process or the nodes can't process it. It's like the infrastructure for Bitcoin is infinitely scalable. And so we can trap all of the, the economic value of today and all of the economic value of 50 years from now, which is going to be exponentially more than we have right now, will be trapped in that 21 million unit base currency, which is called Bitcoin. All right, that's a beautiful uh, explanation. I, I love it a lot. Um, you brought up, I think, one, two times uh, the Bitcoin social layer. I think that's a, a word or a, a, a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. Um, how, how do you define it? Like, what's the Bitcoin social layer? Yeah, the Bitcoin social layer, simply put, is anybody that is furthering the mission of Bitcoin. If you stack stats, you're, you're, you're on the Bitcoin social layer. If you are tweeting uh, to the, you know, to, to some billionaire fiat maxi, have fun staying poor. You're part of the fiat or you're part of the Bitcoin social layer. Like you're, you're doing a podcast. You're part of the Bitcoin social layer. You're, you're part of this interconnected group that is furthering this mission. Um, like who would you call? And I'm, I, all my references are like uh, American references. Sorry. But it's like, who would you call an American revolutionary? It's like anybody that contributed to the American Revolutionary War, right? Were the, were the revolutionaries, were they only the guys that marched out onto the battlefield and, and, and shot their musket? No, I think it was the people that, that were the regular people that were also contributing to the war effort. Maybe they were, they were furthering the propaganda message of the, of the revolutionary cause, or they were contributing um, funds and resources to the cause or whatever it was. There was, there were so many people in a revolution that never fired a musket. And so we might say that, well, Michael Saylor's that he's the revolutionary or, uh, Peter McCormick or Robin Sayer or these, any, any one of these people that's like out there in the public eye, those are revolutionaries for sure. You guys are revolutionaries. But the guy that just, again, my barber who accepts some sats for a haircut, he's a revolutionary. He's part of the Bitcoin social layer. And guess what? When you're a part of a network, that network becomes, we also, we all understand Metcalf's law and how network effects work. Every time somebody plugs into the Bitcoin social layer, the network becomes exponentially more valuable. So we're, we're creating more value every time somebody comes on. And the good news is, I, I don't think there's ever been a day where the Bitcoin social layer has gotten smaller. Nobody gets into Bitcoin and then gets out of it. People get into crypto and then get out of it because they got burned. They held their money on FTX or something like that. Nobody gets into Bitcoin and then gets out of Bitcoin. So today there are more people in Bitcoin than there were yesterday. Yesterday, there were more than there were the day before. Tomorrow, there's going to be more than there are today. So the trend is your friend. The trend is that the Bitcoin social layer is growing and it's growing fast. And every time there's more people connected to it, there's more people that I have in my social network that gives me more influence. It gives you more influence. It gives them more power and influence. And guess what? It's taking power and influence away from the existing system because that network is losing people it is losing nodes from its network there are less people plugging in or there's there's less people connected to the fiat social layer than there were yesterday so if it's about who's running up the scorecard the bitcoin social layer is winning and i'm betting and you are as well i'm betting everything i have on it um and this isn't this isn't a decision we made easily we probably made this decision kind of begrudgingly the old way of life was was easy but we saw that there was going to be a clear path to victory. And so we adopted the winning side. Really, really cool. I also feel like, um, I think with Nico, when I spoke with Simply Bitcoin, uh, we, we kind of brought the comparison up with um, content creators, podcasters, people that are just outspoken about Bitcoin, not, e not even only in, in social media, but also like uh, uh, offline. I spoke yesterday with someone who is out there every day going around the city and speaking with random people about bitcoin with his bitcoin shirt like he that th those uh with the content creators with the podcast with everyone those are the soldiers of the new information warfare mm -hmm. i feel like uh, when when people ask me oh can can bitcoin uh create a new war a new world war no we are already in there like it's an information warfare like it's a cyber warfare uh we we have to be we, we have to stick up for, for, for what's right and for what's, what's good. And I think your uh, explanation goes really, really nicely in there. Now, 
what role do you think Nostra and decentralized social media uh, plays into that? Or maybe even places like Rumble and X, by the way, my podcast, uh, I because of Simple Bitcoin, I was finally also uh, getting a, a, off my ass and also put my show on Rumble. <laughs> good. Uh, I, I, finally, I did it. Uh, it's a lot of work uploading all the episodes on, on Rumble mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. uh, but I finally also did it. How do you see the role of uh, completely decentralized, like Nostra, but uh, a little bit more centralized, but uh, f um, a little bit more freedom of, of speech than other players like Rumble, like uh, Twitter or X? Mm. So a couple a couple things there. I think it's awesome that you're you're switching it over to Rumble or not switching over, but you're adding to, you're creating that content for Rumble, right? It's creating that marketplace. So anybody, if I want to as a viewer, go over to Rumble, I now have more content. It's the same thing with the Bitcoin parallel economy. It's the same thing with this. I would actually consider Rumble and what you're doing with that part of the parallel economy. It's all part of the same thing, but it's it's providing now a place for me to go. It's giving me those options. So it makes it easier for viewers to make that switch as well. So you making the switch makes it easier for somebody else to make the switch, just like me spending stats makes it easier for somebody else to spend stats. Same idea, um, but you're doing that as an investment. You're not going to get a return on your on your investment for putting putting those videos over there. There's just not enough viewers for that to be your sole income. Like you couldn't switch over to Rumble entirely. You're doing it as an investment. You're you're doing it knowing you're not going to get a return on investment now, but three years from now, what all the time that you took to put your videos on the, over on Rumble, that could be the greatest move you've ever made as a podcaster because again, you saw ahead of the curve. You put the time in when it didn't make sense. You know. It, it's not going to give you any financial gain right now. It's a long-term, it's a long-term uh, bet you're making on that. I think that's the right bet. I, I actually, I, I, I believe that firmly. Um, the, sorry, the, the second part of your question or the, the, the main part of your question, can you repeat that for me? It was uh, about the, yeah. oh, Noster, right? Yes. Decentralized yeah. and first decentralized. Noster, absolutely critical for what we're doing. We need to have decentralized communication platforms. That's, that's a, massive piece of this. We need to have a check. I actually don't think we're going to ever have to go over to Noster entirely. You know why I don't think we're going to have to do that? Because Noster exists. If Noster didn't exist, we would have to go to something like Noster and it just wouldn't be there. But because Noster exists, that acts as a check on centralized for, uh, social media. They can only get so bad because there's an exit. The most powerful thing any human being can do, and this is certainly true in business, so I'll just say, but it, it, it's true for every element in life. The most powerful thing you can do in business to somebody is say no. When you say no, you have all of the power. And so when you tell Facebook, no, I don't need you because I can go to Noster. Twitter, Elon, I, I like you right now, but hey, you want to get crazy? Guess what? No, I will not use Twitter anymore. I will not use X. I'm going to go to Noster. Elon's smart. He knows that Noster exists. He, he again, I, I think he probably shares the miss, mission to some degree. It's kind of Elon, I feel like is like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I don't trust Elon, but I do think, I don't think there's an evil cabal out there. I think there's a hundred evil cabals and they're all fighting each other. And so I think that Elon is, uh, is definitely doing war and some of those things align with us right now. But again, Elon could switch or somebody else could come in and, and buy Twitter and, and take that over. And all of a sudden that platform is uh, is a problem as well. We would desperately be wanting Noster. And if we're not building Noster, then then that would be that would be a huge problem. If we're not putting content out there or whatever. Like I think that, that that's that's very critical. Um, it's just like the CBDCs. I think when CBDCs come around, CBDCs will not be nearly as bad as they would have been had Bitcoin not existed. CBDCs would be the the blight of humanity they would be the most tyrannical tool in human history if bitcoin didn't already exist bitcoin is a giant middle finger it's a giant no to cbdc so cbdc will come out they're not going to be great they're going to be worse than what we have right now but they're not going to be as bad as they would have been because bitcoiners and everybody in the world even people that aren't on bitcoin are aware of bitcoin we have this no ready to go if you get too crazy and so the presence of Noster is like a preemptive attack on censorship. Um, but if the if the establishment, if the people that are, you know, Facebook and those people, if they don't see that becoming a more thriving, robust uh, network, 
then then they're actually going to stop caring that it, it exists. They're going to start to get worse. They're going to encroach on our freedoms even more because they said, well, people actually don't want to use Noster. Um, so we can actually just stick it back to these people because ultimately they're going to use our platforms. So it is important that we go over and that we, that, that we use those things and build out those things. So in the same way, I'm making a, a case for spending your sats. We need to start dabbling in those types of things. Um, my worry with Noster is that it doesn't have the economic incentives of Bitcoin um, where like to run a node um, or to a, a relay for, for Noster. You're not getting like mining rewards or, or, or anything like that. Um, it's kind of more similar to node operators for Bitcoin. You run a node because, well, actually with, with Bitcoin, there is there, there is that because then you you can validate your own transactions and all that kind of stuff. So, so there is kind of an economic incentive to running even a Bitcoin node or certainly to be a miner, there's an economic incentive. So I hope that some economic incentives kind of get built into Noster so that um, it's not all mission-driven people. Now that's the great thing is that there's enough people that, care about their privacy and their free speech that they will contribute to this network. So perhaps voluntary uh, interaction with the network is going to be enough. But I do think that that's why that's why we need a balance of central ent entities like Rumble um, or we need central entities like Orange Pill app where like it's terrible to say, oh, we're a central entity. No, we're a company that has the same mission as something like Noster. We're, we're, we're trying to connect Bitcoiners. We're trying we're where Nostr's for your online connections, Orange Pill apps for your offline connections. Do we think that Orange Pill apps the solution for everything in the Bitcoin social layer? No, it's literally just this, this one piece to meet other Bitcoiners in real life. I think that's very, very important. We also have a really good spam filter and, and a filter to, to filter out bots. I think that's gonna be one of the biggest problems we have in the future going forward. Our AI bots, it's gonna be very convincing. Um, Somebody's gonna be talking on the other end of a text message or even a video call like this, and, and you might not be able to tell if it's a real person or not. Proving somebody's a human is going to be incredibly valuable in the next few years. And so Orange Pill app is probably one of the only apps in the world that's gonna help you do that. You're gonna know who, who's a human. So Orange Pill app, by being able to verify, hey, I shook hands with this people, this person, or hey, I shook hands with Nico from Simply Bitcoin, and then he shook hands, he met Robin at a conference somewhere. I now know Robin is real because I have social connection, social proof to know that Robin is real. That also validates Robin on Nostra. I know he's a real person. I know he's not just a CIA, a CIA bot somewhere that was created to you know, you know, know, uh, be, be controlled opposition or something like that, right? It, it also validates and it verifies and it helps reinforce the Noster network because uh, Orange Pill app has helped validate that person in real life. So these things have this synergy and that's how any revolutionary, any revolution works. You need to have synergy amongst different technologies. And that's, that's one of the three necessary components for a paradigm shift. This is one of the things I cover in parallel is in order for a paradigm to shift, meaning the way the world operates, in order for it to shift, you need to have three things. And if you don't have those three things, you won't have a paradigm shift. There's been all sorts of movements that tried to change history and they didn't. It's because they didn't have these three things. They didn't have a will for change, okay? There, there, there's a problem and people wanted to change. Well, that's, that's all the time. People always want change. So how come the world's not always changing? Well, it's because there has to be a social layer that connects those people, right? Because who cares if a million people want change, but those million people don't know each other? Okay, the social layer is what the glue that holds all that will for change together. But the third thing is technology. The people want change. There's a social layer, but they, they need a technology so that they can play on an even playing field with the big boys, right? The, the, the powers that be have incredible power. Well, now technology evens the playing field. Noster, Orange Pill app, Bitcoin, those things are rumble. Those things are absolutely necessary for a paradigm shift. We have to have all three of those components. The good news is that the table set, the stake is ready. The, the, like the, you got your, your Rugers, like you, you, you're ready to go. We have everything in place. It's just now we need to act. That's a, that's a beautiful description. It's also, uh, it reminded me when you said uh, it's important that we have uh, Nostra in place, also for places like X and Rumble. Um, do you think that Bitcoin then could even benefit the US dollar because they all of a the sudden see there's a, 
event that can actually uh, really g g get uh, way more powerful or we have to be a little bit more careful with spending money and a little bit more careful with printing money? Do you think that's a possibility or is the system already on a trajectory uh, with the fiat system where they have to print so they can keep it uh, one year or two years more alive? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, there's just no chance that the fiat system survives. It's it's literally a downward spiral that, that nothing can plug that hole. There's a very interesting caveat to that. And if Trump, you know, if he has Robert F. Kennedy in his ca ca uh, cabinet, who actually does seem to understand Bitcoin a little bit, Trump seems to very much be uh, appealing to the Bitcoin base, but not know much about Bitcoin. But if they do adopt a treasury position of Bitcoin, not even backing the US dollar. I don't think they're ever going to say, oh, Bitcoin's backing the US dollar. But there is a cheat code here that can happen one time in history. And, and humanity can shoot it shot this one time or it never will. It can be the only time in history that a fiat currency gets a little bit of life to it beyond what it should have. Because you can infinitely print dollars and Bitcoin is scarce, they and and when you have a big pool of economic value versus call bitcoin a relatively small pool of economic value one dollar out of the big pool doesn't change the big pool but one dollar into the small pool has a much bigger effect and so you could drain funds print money out of the big pool of fiat and every billion dollars that comes out of that pool isn't going to affect the value of the dollar. Inflation is not going to go up very much because of that billion dollars coming out. But every billion dollars going into Bitcoin is going to make the value of Bitcoin go up at a faster pace than you devalue your currency. So the U.S. government theoretically could use this cheat code to buy so much Bitcoin. They could buy enough Bitcoin. They could buy $50 trillion worth of Bitcoin, legitimately buy $50 trillion worth of Bitcoin, and then pay off the U.S. debt. And so that downward spiral of having to borrow more money in order to pay off the existing debt, that, 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 in, that it's like somebody that has a credit card balance that's maxed out and then they get another credit card to pay that initial credit card. They don't have enough money in their account. That's what's happening. We just keep borrowing more. We keep getting more credit cards to pay our existing debt. If we had a way to buy Bitcoin to where we could pay off all our credit card debt, Theoretically, yes, the value of the dollar would have gone down quite substantially in that period, but the, the the debt would be erased, and so the cycle could kind of be reset. Yes, your minimum, you know, the smallest type of U.S. currency wouldn't be a dollar anymore. That uh, maybe a hundred dollar bill might be the smallest unit of currency. Yes, we would have devalued our currency, but it would then be stable for a relatively uh, relatively long period of time. The thing is, once the U.S. has done that. I don't have a lot of faith that they won't go back to borrowing money going forward. That's the only other problem is, yes, we would have reset the clock. We would have, yes, we would have devalued our currency, but we have no debt. And so we can let the, the U.S. dollar can live on for another 75 years. But sure enough, a socialist will come in and say, guess what? Now we can afford to give everybody free college and we can give everybody free health care and we can give everybody. All, so all the promises will start over again. The cycle will start again, but it will be the longest currency to to live in human history if somebody does that yeah uh, it, it, it could basically uh prolong in the life of fiat but not uh prevent it from its death eventually yeah uh, I, i agree a lot um now we have one question that every guest uh gets uh what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already heard from you i am a father of four um, I have three biological girls and I have, uh, my son is adopted. Um, I growing up, I always thought I'd have like two kids and that's it. I'm at four kids. I'm 38 years old. I probably shouldn't be having more kids. I would, I would have 10 more kids if, uh, if, if, if that my, my perspective on leaving a legacy and a family dynasty and not saying a dynasty and like, Oh, wealth and prosperity and all that stuff, but like leaving a, a dynasty of people, of children who have good values that are providing for their families and making the world a better place. I really like producing humans <laughs> that, that do that kind of thing. And so whether I'm done at four or whether we adopt some more children or my wife and I, you know, we get pregnant again, I, I would, I would have, you know, more children. Um, and I think that uh, my perspective on that has changed quite a bit. So that that's actually something that, that I, 
I'm kind of not wrestling through, but it's just something that's on my mind a lot in life. And so I'll share that with you guys here today. Uh, wonderful. Have more kids, guys. <laughs> Amazing. I love it a lot. Uh, perfect. Then we come to the end routine of the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, we have the question from a previous guest. It, it is a really cool one. What was your fur? What, what was your worst fiat experience? First fiat experience was, was, was probably what, Oh no, no uh, worst, sorry. My, my worst fiat experience. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I said best. Sorry. My worst fiat experience, I think, led to it would eventually lead to me becoming a Bitcoiner. But it was years before um, when my wife and I, when we graduated from college, we had saved up. We knew we were, we were going to get married because we were college sweethearts. We both worked full time. We saved a ton of money. We saved we saved a, enough money to, to put a down payment on a house. But I graduated from college in 2008. So that was the great financial crisis. And I walked into the bank with my wife um, like, hey, look at we have this big big down payment for 22 years old. I thought this was this huge amount of money. And of course the bank's going to give me a loan for a house. This is like the American dream come true. The banker laughed us out of the bank. He, cause this is again, the financial crisis and you're 22 years old. You don't have any credit history. He literally laughed at my credit history. He goes, you have two years of head credit history. You think we're going to loan you a house? Wait, you only made this much money. He laughed me out of the bank. So I remember, I remember thinking I graduated from college early. I worked full time. My wife worked full time. She graduated from college early. Man, we are hard workers. I I went in thinking we we've done the work to buy a home, and yet this guy's standing between me and this house and is laughing at my work. I just remember thinking that that was so disrespectful. Um, and I remember at that point being like, you know, screw the banks. Like I don't I don't I don't need them and I don't want them. That that's a beautiful story. Really cool. Thank you so much. Before I let you go, uh, where can people find you and ask you questions? Orange Pill App's a great place to reach out to me. Um, I'm I'm somewhat responsive on X as well. Sorry, I go back and forth between calling it Twitter and X. Um, we do lots of SaaS giveaways on X, so so please keep an eye out. It's at Brian Dement. Um, I also started a, a YouTube and Rumble channel as well. I'm putting it out on Rumble as well. But um, I, I just it's it's pretty much all shorts. So it's all Orange Pill shorts. Like uh, how do you you know? questions for your no pointer friends like is bitcoin like tulip mania or if bitcoin is infinitely divisible then does that is that a problem for bitcoin scarcity right like those types of questions that you get from your no coiner friends they're 60 second or less a lot of them are 30 seconds and they're quick answers like you can tell i don't say anything in 60 seconds or less everything i do is this like rambling on the answer I, the shorts and the editing process allows me to be quick and to the point, And I can assure you, you will orange pill some people with these shorts. So go check those out. It's just my YouTube channel. Just look up Brian DeMent on YouTube or Rumble. Brian, so much. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Also, thank you so much for everyone watching and listening for being on. Uh, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.